Thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, first word. Good morning. Good morning. Earlier, Senator Wyden asked you a question about the most consequential change you've made at the IRS in response to our report. I think your answer was your employees can now email you in a new special email box that was just created. That was the most consequential thing you've done based on a report. I think what I said, the most consequential thing I've done is try to get every employee to view themselves as a risk manager. If they see any problem they have any issue with about any question, they should immediately report it to their manager. If they have any concern that it's not going up the chain of command, they should report it either directly to our risk management office or they should report it directly to me. So they have an open line of communication. Our problem, I think, we've done a whole range of things. My testimony is full of those that we've adopted. I do think that ultimately for us to avoid these kind of problems, we need to have a situation where no problem gets hidden, no gotcha. problem gets ignored, I'm going to problem moves up. I'm going to move on to my questions, but I, I, I do believe as I listened carefully to your answer, um, the answer that you gave, though your testimony is filled with recommendations and suggestions based on your limited ability to move forward without legislative action is that there's a new email system in place where your employees can directly I, I email you. I think that's you. an improper character. Okay, good enough for you. Here's a question for you. And why are we here? I think this is very important for us to remember why we're here having this conversation or having this hearing. It is because in the IRS, uh, an agency in the federal government with amazing power of intimidation, there was, has been, and hopefully no longer is, a culture of discrimination. And if this culture of discrimination that focused and targeted conservative organizations, Tea Party and other conservative groups, 300 plus, and in addition to that, also audited individuals who were making conservative contributions. So we're here today not to have a conversation about simple structural change. We're actually here today because there was a culture of discrimination in the agency that has the power of intimidation in a way that no other agency in the federal government has, and it used that power of intimidation against conservative organizations, and then there was a cover-up of that intimidation. That's why we're having this hearing today. If you think about the fact that those conservative organizations cumulatively waited nearly 600 years 600 years to receive an IRS determination, we should seriously consider what actions are necessary for us to make sure that that culture never again exists. You were brought in as a turnaround man to turn this around. And as Senator Grassley asked, who's been fired? What, have been, what are the disciplinary uh, measures that you've taken. Do you have the power to fire the employees who were involved? Because we know that there, we have the power to promote some of the employees because obviously some have been promoted as Senator Roberts has clearly stated earlier. I'm concerned as a taxpayer uh, with the breaches that we've had uh, that the, the new culture is a culture that is still as inconsistent with the right direction as the old culture. And my concerns for the 8,000 South Carolinians who've had their information exposed because of the breach uh, is just on top of the concern that I have for this culture uh, that seems to target individuals based on this notion that America is a nation of free speech. And if they don't like it, there's someone in the IRS that can tamper it down. That is a problem from my perspective that we should pay close attention to. And then, uh, Mr. Koskinen, uh, you mentioned in your opening statement that there are limited resources. Uh, my question is, if there are limited resources at the turnaround guy, should you ask for the ability to take the employees, the 200 plus employees who are working full time on union activities, uh, should you take the 600,000 hours, the 600,000 hours invested yearly 
on only union activities, mm -hmm. should you redirect, if you had the power, the $27 million of taxpayer resources in a different direction so as to meet the obligation of the IRS as it relates to actually dealing with taxpayers? And if you don't have that authority, which I'm sure that you don't have all the authority, should a part of your response be asking for the authority. Because perhaps we need the legislation that will empower you to complete the job as a turnaround guru that I'm sure you could be. And if you need that legislative action, tell us what it is so that we can work with you in making sure that the IRS is the premier agency within the federal government that emboldens people to have great confidence in the outcome and in the process. I would love to partner with you in that journey. <clears throat> if I could respond. Uh, brief, briefly, Mr. Commissioner, uh, Senator Roberts is next. Yeah, but can I respond sure, to? of course. <clears throat> First, I appreciate the offer of support. Yes, it sir. is important to uh, ensure that public has confidence. Uh, you mentioned, in, uh, as a fact, the culture of discrimination. There is no evidence that supports that there was any culture of discrimination. As noted, the Department of Justice interviewed 100 different employees of the IRS, some who identified themselves as conservatives, some as Republicans. None of them said that political bias had entered into any decision. In terms of individual audit selection, anyone who is claimed yeah. to be targeted, uh, the <clears throat> Inspector General has looked at over 100 of those cases and have found not one where anyone was, quote, targeted because of their political activity. So we need to deal with the problem but we need to characterize it appropriately. The committee, in a bipartisan way, listed a set of recommendations they thought would saw a deal with this problem. We have said and committed to implementing all of those recommendations within our control. We remain committed to making sure that the situation doesn't happen again. Groups should not have to wait for 250, 500 days to get certifications. And in fact, it should be noted, which we sometimes forget, you can set up a C4 organization and go into operation without the approval of the IRS. So that anyone who wants to set up tomorrow morning or wanted to over the last several years to become a C4 <coughs> would do that on their own without our approval. Right. Part of the reason they need or seek our approval is because the rules are complicated in terms of what the facts and circumstances are, and they want to be able to have us review that in terms of facts and circumstances, which is why I think if we could clarify and not rely on, quote, facts and circumstances, it would be much easier for those interested in becoming C4 organizations to set up and operate with a set of confidence that the rules are clear and that nobody's going to second-guess them. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Nick. Chairman, I, I do need to respond to what he said. If you don't mind, give me 30 seconds. I appreciate very it very briefly. much. Very briefly. In a document cited at the top of page 153, Lerner compares the approach that led to getting Al Capone to using audits to, to intimidate tax-exempt organizations. Lerner's improper intervention into the audit process is described in Section 2C5B of the Republican Reviews. Examples include how Lerner may have directed audits of Crossroads GPS, a group affiliated with Ms. Palin. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Okay. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Thune. 